Good morning, class. This is Tim. Hope everybody is safe and well. Um, this I'm going to do a lecture on Learning Plan 11 on driven steel piles. So let's go from the beginning here. All right. Okay. Okay, driven steel piles. Why why do we need driven steel piles? So typically, if our we can't support our foundations sh on uh, and shallow use shallow foundations due to weak soils underneath the shallow foundations. A lot of times we have to go deep, use deep foundations to get down to a more firm bearing strata, or a lot of times down to bedrock. Okay, so we have different materials here. This is an H pile here. If you look at that, okay. Um, here they call pipe piles. This is a tapered, tapered um, shoe, they call them. Okay. This is a closed ended pipe pile. Okay. So what they do is they weld this close on. So when they drive it, this will actually displace the soil. And then this allows them to fill, fill the concrete or the pile with concrete when they're done. Um, if they drove this one over here, let me get my little cursor going on here. So if they fill this one here, it, it gets filled up with soil, then we can't fill it with uh, concrete. So um, these these will displace the soil around the pile that it's easier to drive, okay? And then a lot of these are called batter piles. So depending on if there's horizontal loads, we need to drive them at an angle to resist loads, okay? So H piles or pipe piles are typical for steel. All right, so how does, how does driven steel piles work? So basically from physics, we have potential energy. A crane picks up a weight. Once it drops, it turns into kin kinetic energy. And then basically it puts work on top of the pile and the energy gets transferred down through the pile, through the pile material into the surrounding soil. Okay, so basically that's how driven piles work. So it's, uh, there's quite a bit of engineering on driven piles to figure out how, how far we got to how far we have to drive them to achieve the the bearing capacity of the pile without exceeding the stress of the pile so we don't break the pile basically so it's a it's a engineering feat there okay types of pile driving hammers diesel okay we have hydraulic we have air and steam oops so we'll talk about a little bit of each so diesel is basically Literally, it's a diesel. Basically, what happens is diesel fuel is injected into the uh, into the system, and then due to the weight of the hammer falling down, it explodes the diesel fuel under compression, and it pushes the hammer back up, and it falls back down. Hydraulics, it's literally hydraulic. It, it hydraulics pull the hammer up and push the hammer down, and then there's air and steam, which is same as diesel. Basically, it pushes the hammer up and it free falls back down. Okay, diesel hammers. So these are the most common reliable diesel hammers. These work really well in the winter, um, just less problems and stuff. Okay, open-ended, single-acting, okay, close-ended, double-acting. Okay, open-ended, single-acting pile. Uh, basically, uh, it blow, it shoots up, and then gravity takes it down. Close-ended, basically, the hammer goes up, it hits uh, a shelf on top, and it forces it back down. Okay, so here's kind of an analogy of this. So here's an open-ended. As you can see here. Once the explosion happens, the hammer flies up in the air, and there's nothing stopping it. Okay, so so this is a single acting diesel hammer. So okay, there's a fuel pump. It, it by gravity it falls down. Once it explodes, it exhausts. It shoots back up, falls back down. Okay, so we need enough resistance for this to work. Okay, all right, double acting. As you can see, it's enclosed. So basically, the explosion happens. It hits the top and it shoots it back down. So the energy is different. Okay. So the most common diesel hammer are open-ended diesel hammers. Okay. All right, hydraulic and air steam hammers. As you can see, here's the lift cylinder. It lifts it, drops it, lifts it, drops it. Okay. So it's all by hydraulic oil. All right. So I have a couple pictures here, or some. So this is an open-ended steel hammer here. So you can see this is the exhaust. 
So as soon as that hammer falls, it explodes and it sh put, shoots the hammer up in the air and then it free falls back down. Okay. So you can kind of see it bouncing. There's a bunch of cushions down there and I have some more videos. Okay, if we go to this one. Okay, so there's this is a single acting diesel hammer. See that smoke? Fuel gets inserted in there. The hammer hits it, explodes, it pushes it back up. Okay, so these only way these work if we have enough resistance down here for that pile to be resisting to, to create enough resistance for that explosion to occur to for that hammer to come back up. Okay, and basically what we're doing is we're counting the blows per foot. Okay, so the energy is hitting the top of the pile through the whole length of the pile into the soil. Okay, so here's a little close up. So it's, there's the exhaust, see the hammer? So this is called stroke height. So the higher this goes up, the more energy, more work is putting into that pile. So that's a big key in on the resistance of these piles. It's a very dirty, messy job. But it's an important job, understanding what we need to re have these piles be resistant. Okay, here's a, just another. See the stroke? It's very low. The resistance, the soil resistance is very soft. So we're not getting a very good stroke height versus the last one where if, when the soil gets stiffer or we're on bedrock, this will start going higher and higher. As you can see, it's starting to get higher because our pile is getting lower and lower. There's more side friction on the side of the pile as it gets deeper, so the resistance is bigger. So these are the cushions. This is the helmet. So as you can see, this is 50 feet below the ground, 51, 52 feet below the ground. Okay. So here's another. So this is a really high stroke length. Okay, this pile's... So they call, see this, I'm watching this, this mark here, or basically from here to here, I'm counting the blows. So every time that pile goes down, they call it set, okay? And then there's a machine that I, I need to figure out my stroke height, because that depends on the energy to being delivered into the pile. So it's a pretty high stroke length there. So now you know what's going on when you see this going on. There's a lot of engineering that goes onto this. So here's all the pile mechanics. All right, here's another one. So I want you to see, you notice what's happening here. Very soft. We got trapped groundwater in here. They're, the pour water pressures aren't dissipating here. So the pile is bouncing and the hammer isn't working very effectively. Okay, so we're trying to pound that pile in there. As you can see, it's just kind of bouncing. So because of the closed, these are closed-ended piles, so we're displacing that soil sideways, but the, we can't compress the water, so it's having a hard time pounding into the ground there. So you can see how it's just bouncing. I want you to notice something. See those little bubbles right here? So what's happening is we're trying to push, displace the water. There's a sheet pile wall behind us. That's the earth retention system. Okay, I'm 30 feet below the street level right now, so that water can escape. Okay, so that's what's going on here. It's because the water can't, the pore pressures can't escape. Interesting. Okay, parts and pieces of the hammer. So the anvil or ram. Okay, so we, so me as an engineer, I need to know the uh, some cr critical information for me to de decide my stroke and how many blows per foot I need to pound those piles to, to get the capacity of the pile. So anvil or ram. So I need to know the weight of that. Each hammer, each type of hammer has a different kind. The weight. 
in the distance of the hammers falling, okay? Hammer cushion, so there's a hammer cushion inside the mechanism, so that basically, so we don't go metal on metal, because if metal is metal, hits on top of each other, basically destroys itself. So I need to know the material types and its thicknesses, because that will take up energy from going into the pile into the soil. Then I need a, a cap or a helmet, okay? So basically that's the metal sitting on top of the pile, okay? The, the hammer falls, the ram, it falls, it hits the cushion, and then from the cushion, it, the energy goes down into the cap or helmet, and I need to know the weight of that because that weight um, will um, dissipate energy and it provides force pushing that pile into the ground. So, and then there's a pile cushion. So this that's between the helmet and the top of the pile. Thickness and type. Typically, it's not used. Um, typically, what we do is we have an extra two feet of steel on top of the pile. Uh, we drive the pile, and what they do is they cut it. They cut it off with a torch because it'll be all deformed. So, okay. So if you look here, look at the hammer. So here's our pile. So here's this is the helmet. Okay. This is the helmet here. So the pile cushion, or the hammer cushion, is actually in here. Okay. So the, the ram is in here. Here's where all the cushion is. And then this is the helmet mechanism. Okay. This helps center the pile. Okay. So typically we don't use the pile cushions. Okay. So and this is how that, this is some diagrams there. Just a close-up view of the hammer. So I need to know all of these little parts and pieces because I'm going to put this into a computer model to figure out how, how far i got to drive those piles. Okay. So as you can see here, this is the pile. This is the helmet. Okay. The cushion is in here. So this is the, this is the helmet. Okay. This is a little bit of, this is a cushion here, and this is, that hits that, and that transfers the energy down. Okay, so more, there we go. As you can see, just a close-up view of, so this stuff wears out and it breaks. So they gotta, we gotta keep an eye on that. That makes a huge difference on the energy. It's all about energy, okay? So basically, big crane to hold it up, leads, pile, and a template to get it where it belongs. So here's a big, as you can see, we were holding up 40-foot pile lengths here. So here's the hammer, big old crane here. Okay, here's the leads. Okay, the surveyors were marking a flag for us. We're getting the leads in the middle of where the pile location was. So these are leads. They stick them in the ground just to start the pile. Okay, here we go. We're lifting the pile into the cage, they call that. See, these were, these are, uh, this is a closed ended pile. Okay. So we get it started. So we mark the piles so I know how deep I am driving there. As you can see, here's a spliced pile right here. Okay. So because of shipping lengths and the size of the crane we have, we can only go uh, use segments of piles. So these piles were being have, had to be driven about 90 feet. So we can only drive 40 feet at a time. So here's they call a splicing ring. So we had to splice piles together. Okay, so they put the other pile on there, put it together. Then we weld it, and then we continue on. So as you can see, he's checking the levelness to make sure these are plumb with each other, these two piles. Okay. All right, so they weld it, and then we just verify that it's welded. So what do we need to do? Inspect. Correct pile type, size, design strength, mill certificates. 36 KSI steel, 50 KSI steel. Basically, we got to make sure we're driving the right pile. Okay, the right size and the pile type. Okay. Splice, welds, and locations. This is the design thing. We want the splices and welds to be in the bottom third um, because of the moment on top of the pile due to overturning moments. Hammer efficiency, not, not all hammers work 100%. Uh, 
So a lot of times we'll run one at 80% one, or run it at 60% because that means the lower the efficiency, the higher the blow counts we need to, to get, achieve that capacity. Stroke length. So how do we measure the stroke length? So either we physically can measure it or we will have a machine that does it. Blow rates, blows per minute. So this helps us determine the energy going into that pile. And then blow counts and set for the last three consecutive inches. So every time that pile gets driven into the ground, they call that set, okay? And then plumbness. So we need to know how plumb the pile is. And then have the piles reach the estimated design depth, okay? Um, so a lot of times what we can do, we can achieve downward gravity loads sooner, uh, I guess, before we can achieve the required length for uplift loads. Because when you look at a high rise, when a wind blows on them, half the piles go into compression, the other half go into tension. So they want to be pulled out of the ground. Okay, so we want to make sure those piles are actually deep enough so we resist the uplift loads for for uplift loads. Okay, so even though we, we're achieving barrier capacity for the gravity loads, we got to make sure they're deep enough for uplift loads. Okay, so here's I write, you know, here's the pile, here's the mill number, here's the certification. Okay, heat number 773 ASTM, the pile type, just checking to make sure things are good. Usually, typically, these are every percentage of these are weld, welds are inspected. Okay, again, here's the closed ended pipe pile. So, here's you can see one right here. This one's filled with concrete and it's cut off. They put these over here just so they don't get filled with water. Okay, grade three, heat 77.3. ASTM A A92. So here's a pile record. Here's the blows. Okay. All right. So if you look at the design load, 300 tons. That's 600,000 pounds. Okay. So we have to do a factor safety too. So we got to each individual pile has to be driven to hold 600 tons. So our 120,000 pounds with a factor safety of two. So that's a lot of load per pile, okay? So I'm counting the blows. I'm putting my elevations down here. Here's my plumb. Here's my initial section. So when it was spliced, okay? A lot of times we were, they were able to splice before they were driving, dri driven into the ground, okay? So practical refusal, 10 blows per inch for the last two inches, okay? So, but we only made it an inch, so and I had a stroke height of 9.3. So this is the information. This is legal documents here. I was, this is verifying that the pile met capacity. So here's all the blows. So I made, drove this pile down 103 feet. So that's, okay. So plumbness, we used a, a level that measured percentages, both north, south, east, west. We took the average of the two. We didn't. We couldn't be over two percent typically because if we're over two percent, then we're creating a, an a excessive moment on that pile because it's not plumb, and that way, it, then we have to reduce the capacity. Okay. So basically, here's my field notes, my pile number, the blows, stroke, plumb, did it meet capacity? So this one here, I wasn't sure, so I have to do some more an, uh, analytical information on there. Okay. So this is kind of a field diary so this again this all this information would go into a, um, a daily report to the client but this was my diary basically on a daily book daily basis okay once in a while we hit these boulders because we actually had piles that I had a pile was almost nine percent out of plum and they were thought that the pile driving company uh, drove the pile wrong, that they actually set it up like that. And I said, no, there's obstructions underneath the ground. And they said, no, there's not. And so I had it, I took this picture basically and showed them, yeah, this is what we hit. So a closed-ended pile like this can hit this and it'll just basically want to um, squeeze around it. So it'll actually tilt it. Okay. So what we had to do there is we had to drive extra piles to achieve the capacity of that pile cap. Okay. So this is called a saxometer. 
So basically, this actually hears every time the hammer hits the pile, it'll actually tell me how deep I am, my energy, and my blow counts for every foot. So basically, I look at that every time. So it counts for me. So, so because the, the key is, I need to know the stroke length. You can't determine the stroke length um, uh, by looking at that diesel hammer because of the, it it goes inside that case. So this will tell me, based on a mathematical equation, my stroke length is nine point four feet. Okay, and this is my penetration. This is my energy. This is my blows per minute. Or right here, blows per minute, thirty nine blows per minute. This is my stroke. This is how deep I was. So this is the information I count down. This counts it for me. Okay. So here's a splice weld. Anybody see anything wrong with this? So if you look this, look at this, you can see this is kind of bulged out. So the, so what happens is this is yield, yielded. Okay. So because of this, typically we have to cut this off, usually a couple feet below, so we have non-yielded steel, and we splice this one to this one. So fortunately, I didn't catch this one in time because um, I was running around the site. So we had to cut this off and re-splice it. Okay, so this is key, something you need to work out. So you don't want that in there. So here's another picture of that. Okay. Design background. So wave equation of analysis of piles. So how do we how do we determine what size hammer, how deep we got to go, what's our stroke, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So pile parameters. So we call it a weep analysis. Pile parameters: toe and skin damping and quake factors. So toe is the bottom of the pile. Skin is side friction. So damping. So remember, as that hammer hits the top of the pile, energy goes through that pile, and depending on the soil, it, it dissipates into the soil. So clay versus sand. And then quake factors are basically how far that pile will, every time I hit the pile, how far will it go into the soil? So that's different, okay? So skin, damping, and then quake factors is toe set, they call it, okay? Based on the hammer size, so I need to know the hammer size. And then basically what I do is I run run this through this analysis. I want to verify that I, I don't exceed 90% of the yield stress of that pile. The FY term, remember that from statics, yield stress. Okay, that's when it starts yielding. So that's what happened to this pile. We exceeded the yield stress. Okay, so we will do that sometimes on the very top of the pile where the hammer's hitting. That's why we want to cut that off because that, from the hammer from here to here the energy dissipates and we don't exceed that yield stress so this is important that we get this cut off okay and then hammer, hammer efficiency and stroke length so knowing all that information i put it in a, in a thing called a wave equation analysis so literally i model my soil boring profile i model my pile diameter i model my hammer all my cushion information my water table um i tell it what kind of capacities i hit in here and then i hit and run and it'll give me a chart similar to this basically depth production depth my stroke and the, okay, so say I'm between 80 and 82 feet below grade, and I have a stroke of eight and a half feet. That means I need 29 blows per foot to achieve the capacity of 300 tons. Okay, and now that includes a so that's 300 ton design load. So I am actually driving it to 600 tons for elevation, based on my elevation through these elevations. Okay, using this hammer and this type of pile. Okay, so that I, that's what I use these charts to figure out how many blows I needed. Okay, so as you can see, the blows go down as the deeper I get because I'm developing more skin friction. Okay, and so if I didn't achieve the depth, basically, so say I'm hitting 116 blows but before 59 feet, we have to reanalyze it because it may not be deep enough to resist uplift load. Okay, so that's what these wave equations do. And after that, we would do a percentage of PDA testing, pile driving analysis testing. Okay, so basically it's an electrical device that hooks up to the pile. The same hammer that was used in production piles 
we would actually be able to measure the actual energy and actual resistance and skin damping factors and everything just to verify that we are able to we're meeting our design criteria and now it's what I look like on a daily basis after driving these piles okay so that's the end of this presentation so basically what I would like you to do is re basically read chapter nine in your textbook and just give a brief summary of what I need to inspect for driven piles, okay? So some of you may be involved with this, some of you may not, okay? So there's, uh, it's it's more than you think. Of, I mean, it, may, it can get boring by discounting blow counts, but there's a lot to, to think about oh, what's going on there. You know, if the hammer breaks and they use a different pile hammer or they change the cushion, so, uh, the pile's out of plumb. So, I mean, there's more than just counting blows. So you gotta verify a lot of information to, to make sure that this pile is meeting capacity because you're holding up a very, very tall, big structure, okay? So that's that's learning plan 11. So here's the lecture notes I just went over. Here's some pile worksheets that I kind of found online that kind of helps you if you're, you know, for different things, if we need different things, okay? Uh, oh, this is foundations, the different kinds of foundations, if you want to review that. But otherwise, that is the end of this presentation. Thank you for your time.